record. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so welcome everybody for our weekly seminar at the Department of uh, Marine uh, Geosciences. Today we are in Europe again and we are jumping to Portugal with our hope, our um, um, visitor, virtual visitor, virtual speaker, Dr. Dulce Oliveira. But thank you very much for having to having accepted to virtually come to Israel, and we hope that uh, you will be visiting us non-virtually in the future. I, I so, some words. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> in the other side of the Mediterranean, you know. So, some words about uh, Dulce. Uh, Dulce Oliveira graduated in marine biology in 2006 and has a postgraduate in quality management and food safety from 2009 and then a master in marine sciences in 2012 and a PhD in paleoclimates from Bordeaux University in France. After the PhD, she was awarded with a postdoc position at Bordeaux and afterwards an Instituto Portugal de Mar de Atmosfera, which is ITMA, in Portugal. In May 2019, she started a six-year contract with the Centro de Ciencias de Mar de Algarve or the CSMR in Portugal to investigate the past Indian vegetation and monsoon response to climate variability. Um, so uh, her work was awarded with three prizes, including L'Oreal Portugal Medal of Honor for Women in Science in 2017. And she is also the principal investigator of the pro project INDRA, which is the Indian Monsoon and Vegetation Dynamics, lessons from two constructing glacier into glacier cycles of the Middle Pleistocene. She has participated in 14 research projects as a, and was a member of the International Pollen Working Group, IODP Expedition 339 and Expedition 353, providing her an opportunity to establish a fruitful network of international collaborations, particularly with friend, French, Belgium, German, South Korean, and Indian institutions. <clears throat> Dr. Oliveira has been very active on uh, dissemination and outreach, participating in national and international scientific meetings, over 70 presentations, and being involved in several outreach initiatives, such as the IPMA Escolas, dedicated to first grade students, talks at schools, and or yet being co-responsible for the scientific pali forums organized by the Marine Geology and Geosciences Division at IPMA since 2014. So, um, so today, uh, Dulce is going to talk about forest responses to past warm climates recorded in deep sea sediment um, and lessons from past and their relevance to the future. So thank you very much for having and uh, for being here and the podium is yours. Okay. Thank you uh, so much for the kind invitation, Nicholas, and for the wonderful introduction. And uh, before I begin the seminar, I have, uh, I have and I would like to acknowledge that all these studies that I'm going to present could not be possible without my quarters. And so during the next minutes, uh, I will briefly show you how my work on palynology has contributed to the fields of the paleoclimate research, giving a special focus on past warm periods, periods and on regions that are very sensitive to the effects of global warming. Wait, my computer doesn't seem to like this. Okay, so I will start the seminar by giving a short overview for those that are not so familiar with these topics about how we unlock the mysteries of past key periods to pollen analysis. Then I will focus on two main sub subjects. So my first point concerns the study of past warm periods in the Iberian Peninsula and the controlling factors responsible for their regional expression. Then I would like to present you the project that I'm now working on and that focus on the Indian monsoon and vegetation dynamics over contrasting glacial interglacial cycles of the mid Pleistocene. So after the introduction of Nicholas, uh, I think I don't need any more to introduce myself. 
Um, however, as many of you are students, I would just like to highlight with my very, very short story that it's never too late to go after our dreams. And um, as an example, I can say a few words about my own background because um, the passion for the sea and the desire to be a scientist is something that is part of my memory since I was a very, very little girl. And that's why I decided to study marine biology 20 years ago. But after that, I worked in a private company and I worked for five years, um, but I decided it was time to follow my childhood dream of being a researcher. So I quit my permanent job and in my first research fellowship, I realized that it was really what I wanted to do. And this is how uh, my passion for pollens and the expression, the past is the key to the future came to my life. And this was the main topic of my master, my PhD, and also now my postdoc research. So first of all, I would like to recap and why polyopolynology works. So uh, we know that pollen is almost everywhere. Plants produce enormous quantities of pollen grains in order to reproduce. Uh, for example, uh, one hectare of forest, it's in the order of millions of pollen grains. And because plants can't move, they have found ways for pollen to be transported from one flower to another. So they rely on vectors to move pollen that can include wind, water, and, and the animals such as in insects and birds. However, only very few grains uh, find the appropriate plant for reproduction because most of the pollen grains are scattered across the landscape or get destroyed. However, and very lucky for us, some grains are trapped in suitable settings, such as anoxy sedimentary environments that exist in soil, lakes, rivers, and oceans, and where the pollen grains are preserved for hundreds, thousands, and even millions of years. During the fossilization process, the cellular content uh, of the pollen is lost but its external wall, as we can see here, uh, and that is called exin, allows the pollen to be preserved because this um, substance is chemically very, very resistant. And these characteristics combined with other principles and other assumptions of the pollen analysis that we will discuss in seconds are the basis of the paleopollinology. So very briefly, the palynology allows the reconstruction of vegetation and climate from fossil pollen, pollen based on the four principles of the pollen analysis. So one, the taxonomy, the taxonomy of the, the fossil pollen can be established based on, based on the specific characteristics of each pollen grain. Two, we assume that the pollen grain truly represents the vegetation. Three, fossil pollen and their assemblage are not transformed by preservation, deposition, laboratory procedures, because uh, pollen has a high, ca a high capacity of pres preservation. And four, the vegetation and climate relationships have not changed over time. So the first, the first principle is uh, very simple. So pollen grains are like the fingerprints of the plants. Um, it, it is true that the pollen grains are microscopic, but they have a large number of characteristics that allow each type of pollen grain to be related to its plant at the family genus level and very often, often also at the species level. Therefore, and in some, each type of plant produces pollen that are distinctive from those of other plants, for instance, in terms of size, shape, apertures, texture of the external surface, etc. Uh, as we can see here in these three examples. For instance, in the first one, we have a circular pollen with pores of a desert plant. And just to point out that these most incredible photos are always taken with the scan, uh, scanning the electron microscope. Then we have here another example of a grass that has a spiny surface, as we can see here and here also. And um, finally, we have the pollen of an oak uh, tree with 
here, as we can see, elongated apertures. The second assumption of the pollen analysis is that the pollen rain represents the vegetation. As I mentioned before, pollen plants produce millions of pollen grains to reproduce. And in the air, the pollen is transported and it's mixed by atmospheric processes and forms the pollen grain, the pollen rain. This pollen rain, it's basically a cloud of pollen mixed uniformly in the air. Then this pollen falls on the landscape here as an example in a lake and is preserved in anaerobic sediments or environments. And that's why we have so many fossil pollen records available from several sedimentary environments. So the third principle of the pollen analysis is related to the excellent preservation of pollen in the sediments. The sporopollen is, a, is part of the external wall of the pollen and is possible um, the most resistant substance of plants being resistant to several chemical and physical degradation and other laboratory procedures. And because of these characteristics, this uh, organic biopolymer has been described as the diamond of the plant world. So in some, the features of the pollen grains that allow to identify them remain unchanged due to this polymer. And in support of all my st statements, I have included here a photo where you can see that intact exins have been found in some really very old pollens, like this one that has 240 million years old and still has a beautiful and intact external wall. And the last assumption is that the climate conditions affecting the modern vegetation have not changed over time. For example, a Mediterranean tree reflects a Mediterranean climate with hot summers and wet winters and never a cold climate. In short, if we consider that the pollen vegetation and vegetation climate relationships that are observed today also existed in the past, we can reconstruct both terrestrial vegetation and the climate of the past. However, I have to point out that uh, like in all disciplines, all the principles of the pollen analysis have bias and associated errors, but this is something that we always have in mind when we are interpreting our data. So finally, as you probably know, uh, we um, can work with pollen on continental sequences that are retrieved from dry land, such as archaeological sites, or from water, such as lakes, or in marine sediments, such as the longest and oldest sequences that are recovered in the framework of IODP, which means the Integrated Ocean Drilling, Drilling Program. So I guess that by now you have already noticed that I am a marine palynologist that works with marine sediments. And therefore, I am a big fan of this paper of Groot and Groot that mentioned almost 50 years ago, uh, 55 years ago, that the marine pollen records are one of the most important tools to track vegetation in climate changes over the quaternary. And I can say that I, actually I was introduced to pollens in the marine pollenology in my master's degree. And I can confess that I'm still fascinated by their potential when we combine terrestrial and marine indicators in the same stratigraphic level. And this is the major advantage over the continental sequence. So in some, I can say that is definitely an amazing tool uh, to understand the interactions on land, ocean, and ice domains and with that, within a common chronological framework. Now, moving on, and just for a bit of context on paleoclimate. So we have geological archives, such as uh, here the global uh, benthic record that is interpreted as reflecting changes in ice volume that show that the world during the earth during the last 1 million years underwent large changes between warm interglacials, 
and cold glacial periods, which were primarily driven by insulation. And for stratigraphic purposes, these interglacials and glacial stages here have been divided into numbered uh, isotopic stages and the interglacials here in red correspond to uh, odd numbers. So I work with marine pollen records and on past warm interglacials. And why do I care about interglacial uh, periods? Well, as I liked it, at least by the two, uh, la the last two IPCC reports and the numbers words, as this one of uh, Fisher and Coalters, uh, these past interglacials can be used as natural experiments for testing how the Earth responds to changes under reduced size sheets and without human impact. And we know that the past does not provide an exact analog for the next century. However, the study of these periods will help us for sure to better understand our present day warm climate and hopefully its future. And for these reasons, it is extremely important to study the strong diversity that characterizes the interglacials in terms of orbital forcing, CO2 and climate responses. As we can see in the insulation curve, in indice CO2 concentrations and temperature anomaly register in Antarctica. And now the million dollar question. So among this large diversity of interglacials in terms of intensity, structure, duration, forcings, etc., which were the ones that we decided to study and why? Uh, I decided to study in my PhD and postdoc research devoted to the interglacial vegetation and climate variability in southwestern Europe. So a huge part of my research concentrated on two key uh, quaternary interglacials, stage 11, centered around 400 kilo years ago, and stage 31, centered around 1070 kilo years ago. The study of these interglacials offered a unique opportunity to address important questions in terms of interglacial climate, because when we compare both reconstructions, we could explore the climate variability of these interglacials that are characterized by contrastive orbital forcing, as we can observe here in the uh, curve of insulation and precession. And in addition, the warmth in the high latitudes of both hemispheres was so remarkable that both interglacials has been described as super interglacials, being characterized by reduced ice volume as recorded, uh, and we can see in the global benthic profile of the Lisiecki and Rainbow. Therefore, these warm periods have been considered as potential analogs for the impact of global warming. Uh, and moreover, I also have to point out that the study of both interglacials also allowed us to assess the differences between the interglacials of the 41 kilo year and 100 kilo year world. To summarize, these two studies revealed the, the, for the first time that unlike other locations at high latitudes where these interglacials were identified as super interglacials, in southwestern Iberia, atmospheric conditions in terms of temperature in moisture and sea surface temperatures were not exceptionally high. Moreover, we also showed that the, dominant, the dominance of precession and obliquity driven vegetation changes during the interglacials of the 100 uh, kilo year world and 41 kilo year worlds. Uh, in this region, southwestern Iberia, that is a region that is very sensitive to precession. So during stage 11, we found that the vegetations and climate changes were dominated by the weak precession forcing, while uh, during stage 31, obliquity was the dominant forcing. Then to study the opposite of the super interglacials, we decide to explore the vegetation and climate dynamics in a cooler world. So we focus on a particular interglacial stage 13 centered around 500 kilo years ago. 
and this interglacial was one of the coolest of the past 1 million years and is associated with high insulation changes and high ice volume as shown here by the benthic stack. And in this study, we found that the vegetation changes and climate dynamics across stage 13 were primar primarily driven by insulation. Nevertheless, uh, our um, study showed that it is essential to consider the role of the large ice volume of stage 13 because it explains the higher tree fraction and composition due to increased uh, precipitation over this region. So unfortunately, this was just a, a, a brief uh, overview of some studies that we have made uh, on this region. And unfortunately, I do not have time to present in detail all these works. So today I decided to focus on the study of stage 11 and 19 because their analogy uh, between the Holocene and the current interglacial and also its future still remains interesting, complex, and controversial. And if, before I move on to a, a brief overview of these interglacials, I would, I would like to draw your attention to this graph and note that although the levels of insulation of the three interglacials are quite similar, we cannot say the same for the highest volume levels. So here. As stage 19, here in bloom, appears much more glaciated than uh, stage 11 in the Holocene. And please could keep this in mind because I will show you later why this difference is important. So as I mentioned, um, now stage 11 uh, in stage 19, which is centered around 780 kilo years ago, have re received particular attention from the scientific community because its orbit orbital configuration resembles uh, the Holocene. And just to um, recap, the insulation is driven by the position of the Earth relative to the Sun and is controlled by three astronomical parameters. So we have eccentricity that reflects the shape of the Earth uh, orbit around the Sun, then we have precession, which is the oval of the Earth's rotation axis, and obliquity that refers to the tilt of the axis. So these interglacial stage level in 19 have been used as potential analogs for the current interglacial because their orbital forcing is similar in terms of low eccentricity, weak precession variations and weak precession variations here. However, stage 19 here in black has been suggested to be an even better analog for the Holocene because its phasing between precession and obliquity is more similar to the Holocene here the curve in green than the one of stage 11 here in blue. And this is also suggested by model experiments for the annual surface air temperature, showing that the Holocene temperature is relatively similar to stage 11 here, but it's particularly similar to stage 19 as we can see by the less number of positive and negative anomalies. However, as shown here by the model outputs, there is a strong regional variability of interglacial temperatures. So we wonder, and what are the proxy reconstructions showing? And what about the precipitation change, the hydroclimate response? So having these questions in mind, in this work, we investigated if these simulations, these model simulations, were confirmed by our proxy observations in Southern Europe, and if stage 11 and 19 are also good analogs of the Holocene over the, this region. And what were the controlling factors of the interglacial natural variability? 
And for the sake of time, uh, today I'm going only to present the main results concerning the interglacial intensity in terms of forecast expansion and precipitation. So to address these research questions, we study a top quality marine sequence, the IODP site U1385, also known as the Shackleton site, and that was collected on the expedition 339. This sequence covers the last 1.5 million years and is located in the southwestern Iberian margin. That is considered an exceptional area for the paleoclimate research because it's very sensitive to the high and low latitude process as the ice sheets and the subtropical gyre. And super important, it is also a prime location to undertake pollen analysis. As the pollen grains from the Mediterranean vegetation that occupies here the Tagus Basin are included in the marine sediments of this region, this allows us to track past, vegeta past vegetation changes and also therefore the changes in the westerlies that bring moisture to this region. So uh, in, this study was mainly based on the pollen reconstructions of the three interglaciations. And here I am showing a photo of the main ecological group that I will speak about, the Mediterranean for, forest, which is composed of all the temperate taxa and the Mediterranean taxa. And the expansion of this forest uh, indicates warm conditions and moisture ability in Iberia. And here are some um, photos of the pollen grains that I see on the microscope and that belong to the Mediterranean forest. So being at the microscope, it's a very consuming task. Uh, we can do more or less, or at least here, one sample per day. But as you can see, our fossil pollen are really beautiful. And uh, as an example, here is the fossil of the, the Cidus oak, uh, the olive tree, and the evergreen oak. And this information is just for curiosity. So I have studied five interglacials from the Shackleton side, and in total, I analyzed more than 600 samples and counted more than 80,000 pollen uh, grains. Well, uh, as I point out in the beginning, the strength of our work as marine pollenologists relies on a direct comparison between terrestrial and marine indicators uh, in the same stratigraphic level. So in this multi-proxy approach, we compare the atmospherical driven vegetation changes here with the sea surface temperatures given by the marine biomarkers and the benthic foraminifer records that reflect changes in ice volume. This work in particular was also based on the first model data comparison between the Holocene and its best orbit analogs in southwestern Iberia. And for that, the proxy data profiles were compared with log plume snapshot simulation, a climate model that focused on the interglacial climate optimum. By using the CO2 levels and the astronomical parameters, at the dates of insulation maxima. And in all the simulations, the ice sheets were prescribed with their present day values. So here we present the main proxy results of the three interglacials, the Holocene, stage 11 and 19. And I would like to draw your attention to the record of the Mediterranean forest here in green and to the sea surface temperatures on blue. And the pink, these pink bands mark the optimum forest development. And as we can see, the pollen records show that the maximum forest expansion during here the Holocene was much higher than in the other interglacials, although they were characterized by similar surface waters between 19 and 20 degrees. Therefore, as far as the vegetation and climate variability in southwestern Europe are concerned, stage 11 and 19 cannot be considered as straightforward analogs for the Holocene maximum. 
And as at present, the forest development in southwestern Iberia depends on the moisture ability during the winter season. We put forward the hypothesis that the different magnitude in the forest expansion was mainly driven by different precipitation conditions. And the comparison between the proxy and the model results allow us to test this hypothesis. So here I am showing the results of the simulated tree fraction between stage 11 and the Holocene at the climate optimum. And we can see that the results of the snapshot simulations are in agreement with the data and confirm the lower tree fraction and the lower winter precipitation at stage 11 peak. So then uh, we can wonder and we can question, so what were the main drivers of these changes at the interglacial climate optimum? And to answer to this question, we performed a factor separation analysis to evaluate the contributions of insulation in CO2 to the tree fraction over southwestern Iberia. And the results clearly show that insulation was the major controlling factor of the tree fraction maximum, while CO2 played a minor role. Uh, and in contrast to those results of the model data comparison between stage 11 in the Holocene, the lower forest optimum and the lower winter precipitation, precipitation of stage 19 is not uh, reproduced by the simulation. As we can see, there are no significant difference in the refraction or in the winter precipitation between stage 19 and the Holocene. And we think that these large uh, model data disagreements are probably related to the underestimation of the ice sheet forcing, which, as I told you before, it was prescribed at the present day values in the model simulations. Therefore, we suggest that st stage 19 higher ice volume in comparison with that of the Holocene may have been responsible for its lower winter precipitation and therefore to refraction through the influence in the mid-latitude uh, atmospheric circulation, the west release. And now you understand why I ask you to keep in mind the global benthic profile of Lisiak in Rainbow, where we could see that stage 19 was uh, much more glaciated than stage 11 in the Holocene. So the three main messages to take home, one, stage 11 and 19 cannot be considered as direct analogs for the Holocene, which was characterized by a much larger forest optimum. Therefore, when we speak about Holocene analogs, it is crucial to consider the key role of the hydrological changes. And this is very, very, very important in regions where the vegetation communities are highly sensitive to moisture ability, like the Mediterranean region. Uh, message two, we found that the forest dynamics were mainly controlled by insulation, while CO2 played a minor role. And finally, this study highlights that the interaction with the modeling community needs to be reinforced and future work should include the ice sheet dynamics. And in fact, it was what we did in a recent work of stage 13 that I told you a bit about before. And in this study, the model simulations include the ice sheets and we were finally able to demonstrate the importance of ice sheet forcing to explain the regional vegetation and climate. Last but not least, I just want to say that SAI-21385, it's a unique paleoclimate sequence and there is a lot, a lot I could talk about. Here as an example, I'm just showing the combination of the Mediterranean forest record with the sea surface temperatures and insulation over the 800 uh, years in the Iberian Peninsula. And I would like to point out that the several studies of this sequence have revealed that the Mediterranean forest expansion and composition 
mainly results from the contribution of insulation to its influence on winter precipitation. However, we also find out that the first optimum of the different interglacials is not linear related to orbital ice sheet or CO2 forcing. And of course, as in an orchestra, it's all about teamwork because all of these works would not be possible without so many successful scientific collaborations and the support of several institutions and projects. And this is for sure. <laughs> and uh, science must and will go on. So this is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end of a great story of how the past climate can help us to understand the future. Because later this year, a new IODIC the expedition will extend this remarkable archive to the Pliocene. And now let me move on to another continent, uh, Asia. So in the second uh, part, and it will be more, more short, of the seminar, I'm going to present you my current project devoted to the past Indian monsoon and vegetation changes. And this topic is of particular interest because the changes in the South Asian monsoon affect climate on a global scale. And it's projected that uh, uh, the South Asian monsoon will impact almost half of the world's population by 2015. And this is crucial because the ecosystems of these regions uh, and the agriculture and economy, they are completely linked to the monsoon uh, rainfall. And here, I just want to give you a notion of scale of the Indian summer monsoon. So I did some cal calculations and according to Wikipedia, <laughs> the area of the Indian monsoon impact is almost 150 times bigger than the area of Israel. And actually I did the map and Israel correspond to this uh, uh, small Indian state. Moreover, uh, the impact of the Indian monsoon on a population, uh, it's more than 140 times, uh, times larger than the one of Israel. So uh, knowing uh, and understanding the mechanisms that drive the Indian monsoon natural variability over the past is uh, crucial to improve future predictions. However, and despite the importance of studying past Indian summer monsoon changes, there are very few records available over this region and in particular marine um, marine pollen records as highlighted here in this global compilation of pollen records from quaternary deep sea cores of Maria Fernanda and uh, co-authors. So having in mind uh, these questions, I submitted a project to a highly competitive call of FCT, the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Unfortunately, our proje project was approved. This project is entitled Indian Monsoon and Vegetation Dynamics, Lessons from Contrasting Glacial and Interglacial Cycles of the Mid Pleistocene, or in a short way, just Indra. And I selected Indra, not because only it sounds nice, but because Indra is the Indian god of rain. Uh, moreover, our project has only three months. Uh, however, it has already a web page that uh, you can check for more information and news. So one of the strengths of this project is it's, it's, its team. And this project gather, gathers a multidisciplinary team of paleoclimatology with diverse and proven expertise in marine paleontology, uh, tropical vegetation, paleoceanography, in climate modeling. Moreover, this is also a very international team that includes the participation of uh, six countries. In sum, this project proposes to address three main questions. First, what are, what are the impacts of contrasting 
glacial interglacial climate variability on the Indian vegetation in the Indian summer monsoon, for example, in terms of tropical forest development and precipitation, and also to what are the impacts on the sea surface temperature in the Bay of Bengal. Then we want to understand the relationship between vegetation and rainfall on land in the sea surface temperatures uh, offshore. And finally, given the current and the extensive debate about the drivers of the Indian monsoon, we want to know what are the contributions of the different forcings, such as orbital ice sheets in CO2, on the vegetation and monsoon dynamics during critical states or transitions of a climate cycle, such as glacial maxima, deglaciations, interglacial optima, and glacial inceptions. And if we can answer to these questions, our main goal will be for sure achieved because we will the key mechanisms that control the monsoon, uh, the natural monsoon variability. And uh, to, uh, to answer to these questions, this project was built upon three essential components. The first one of these components was the selection of the key marine archive along with the selection of the key period to study. And in this project, we have studied the marine sequence IODP U1446. This sequence also covers the last 1.5 million years and was strategic drilled close to the river mouth of the Mahanadi River to capture the signal preserved in the marine sediments of all this region that corresponds to the core monsoon zone of India, and it is where the monsoon has its most representative uh, expression. And now you may wonder, and why these specific uh, interglacial and glacial cycles, interglacial 15, glacial 16, interglacial 11, and glacial 12, and the answer also is quite simple. It is because these two cycles occur, occurred here before and after the mid bridge event. So their study allows to explore the natural response of the Indian monsoon to diverse and contrasting boundary climate conditions. Uh, as you probably know, interglacial periods occurring before the mid bridge event as stage 15 are in general longer and characterized by larger ice sheets, cooler temperatures in Antarctica, and lower CO2 than the most recent ones as uh, stage 11. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here because there are other reasons to justify this, the choice of these stages. But of course, I have to mention that the study of my favorite interglacial stage 11 is of a particular, it's particularly important because uh, it's orbital analogy with the Holocene. Although I am aware, as I told you before, that this analogy is still debated. The second component of this project relies on performing a multiprocess study that allows to compare the pollen data here, the pollen data, with the marine um, indicators that are both influenced by the Indian monsoon and because they are taken from the same sample within a common chronological. And in, the third, in this third component, the proxy records will be compared with uh, specifically designed climate simulations to evaluate, evaluate the monsoon sensitivity to orbital ice sheet in CO2, CO2 boundary conditions over the two cycles. In sum, we are using the same approach that we used before, and it was proven highly successful on the Iberian margin. Although in this project, we will introduce two complementary model, models. So you, we will use love clean, and then we will use the fully coupled atmosphere oceans general circulation model that is used in some IPCC reports, this model, the HCM3. And this model overcomes the reduced complexity of love theme and provides more details about the climate physics and process. In addition, it will be possible to obtain the vegetation types 
corresponding to the model simulations by using the biome for vegetation model. So, so, so far, we only have the results of stage 11, and these results uh, highlight the very roles of insulation and ice sheet forcings uh, in driving the vegetation and hydroclimate uh, changes over central India. Therefore, this is definitely a story to be continued, continued and hopefully in an in-person seminar or meeting. So I hope that you all have gained an insight into the forest responses to past warm climates. So thank you for your attention. Obrigado. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you very much, Dulce. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and very nice that you wrote it in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> With no <I> mistake. <coughs> uh, so I am opening the podium for questions from the audience. If there are questions from the audience, there's always questions. <laughs> and since I don't see everybody, so just jump in and ask, please. Yeah. And if you want, you can also send me an email if you some questions will be raised after the, the meeting. Oh, somebody is raising a hand. Manish, please go ahead. Hi, your talk is really nice. Thank you. Actually, I have one question. Like, I want to ask, like, how the Indian monsoon started? How the? Indian monsoon started, like uh, initially, like what are the initial factors by which like the Indian monsoon get started? In the model? Indian monsoon. Okay, but overall? It's like uh, uh, initially, <laughs> initially like, like what are the initial factors? Yes, yes, I understand your question, but I'm not there yet because I'm studying the interglacials uh, and the last one that I'm studying is the glacial 16 and the monsoon has started uh, before and uh, actually I don't know how to answer to your question uh, because I'm not so far and back in time. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Manish. Somebody else has questions? Hmm. I actually had a question, but then you answer it later on. So um, I, I won't ask you that one. Um, but, but, um, well, Itzik? You know, I have a question. I know. <laughs> uh, a small question uh, regarding the methodology. Um, how do you separate? Well, what you see is the amount of pollen. There is quantification of pollen in the sediment, right? Yeah. Uh, you... Yes. Norm normally, we count. Um, so it's different if we are doing the pollen counting in terrestrial sequences in, or in marine sequences. So as I work in marine sequences, normally we. Um, we assume that uh, based on several works that were done, if we count 100 uh, pollen, uh, pollen type, uh, I mean in total, in 20 different morphotypes, um, we get um, an accurate uh, image of the vegetation in the past. Okay, well, there are two parameters that bring you the pollen to where you're sampling. One parameter is the spread of the forest. Mm -hmm. and the other parameter is the, is the wind or mm -hmm. are the transport mechanism. And they are not necessarily the same. I didn't see you refer to how you separate between the two. No, actually it is, uh, it is very difficult to separate these components, but 
uh, these two sequences that I told you about, these two sequences of the IODP that we are studying, they, they are collected very close to the river mouth of the two rivers in Portugal, the Tagus and the Mahanahadi in India. And so we consider that the pollen grains are mainly transported by the rivers to the ocean. Uh, of course, we cannot exclude exclude the wind and the wind transport. And sometimes, for instance, when I was studying the the continent, uh, the marine sequence uh, of shore Portugal, I found some pollen grains that are brought by wind during the coldest events from Africa. And this was very very interesting. So sometimes we have some markers of the transport of the pollens. But uh, we consider that it's mainly transported uh, in this case by by the river. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think it, it, it will be great when we have this new expedition in the, in the Iberian margin, because we will be able to extend all these records very far on time. And, uh, it will be great to answer to many paleoclimate questions that uh, are still unsolved. Yes, fantastic, really. Uh, and yeah, I forgot to say that uh, it was really a, a nice, very clear and uh, very interesting uh, talk. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. you. I didn't have questions about the, 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 the major material because it was so, so well uh, explained. <laughs> presented. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, more questions? Welcome. Well, if so, so we can conclude. Anyway, we are a little bit after the time. Yeah. Luce, would you like <laughs> I'm to... I'm going be... to lunch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're going to lunch. Yeah. Uh, so, Dulce, would you like to be in our mailing list for future events? Mm -hmm. okay, yes, great. I Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. Actually, so, I will attend the next one with Monse. Excellent. Uh, well, Monse comes later because next oh, okay, one, we're going to another Portuguese country, Portuguese speaking country, by the way. We're moving to uh, Brazil. Ah, okay, great. Okay. So, so I will try to be here. Okay, excellent. Okay, and in any case, it will be in YouTube. Okay, and Nicholas, if the students have questions, please uh, give my mail and I can also answer to them. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, have a nice week. A nice Thank week you. to all of you. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.